Wearing glasses is not curing myopia. It's just relieving the symptoms. And we need to start changing the mindsets of the public. And eye care practitioners have a key role in doing this. We have access to tools and techniques which can help us to change our patients' lives by pre preventing future complications. I know we cannot cure myopia at this stage, but by preventing the increase in myopia, you can do a lot of long-term good for your patient. The reason why increasing myopia is a huge concern is because the stats are already telling us that in many countries around the world, such as Tajimi, uh, Japan, um, in cities such as Shanghai, China, uh, uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, as well as uh, Copenhagen, myopic macular degeneration is one of the most frequent causes of blindness in healthy young people. We also know that myopia is a major issue because increasing levels of myopia increases the risk of cataract by five times. It increases the risk of glaucoma by three times. It increases the risk of retinal detachment over 20 times. And it increases the risk of myopic macular degeneration by 40 times. And many of these diseases do lead to permanent vision impairment. And by slowing the progress of myopia and reducing the chances of people reaching high myopia, you will be able to prevent a lot of people from developing these potentially blindness causing diseases. Traditionally, eye care practitioners have corrected myopia using single vision spectacles and contact lenses. But the evidence is showing that increasing levels of myopia is causing or increasing the risk of permanent vision impairment and blindness. And what we can do now as eye care practitioners is manage the myopia so that we can slow the myopia from increasing to levels which can cause damage. Globally, there are about 30% of the people in the world that have myopia. However, if we look at the trend, there's going to be a dramatic increase in the number of people affected by myopia. By the year 2050, 52% of the world's population will be myopic. So there's going to be a dramatic increase in the number of people with myopia. What is most worrying is that 20% of these myopes will have what we call high myopia which is prescriptions worse than minus five. As a result, they would be more prone to eye diseases that can cause permanent blindness and vision impairment. Now, it's not only myopia that's increasing, or the prevalence increasing, but also there's a lot more people with high myopia. And the problem with myopia is that it always um, increases the risk of various eye problems, such as cataracts, glaucoma, as well as myopic macular degeneration and retinal detachment. But when you have high myopia, there's a, a much greater risk of um, having these ocular conditions as well. So the upshot is that if we have more high myopes in the world, then we're going to have a higher prevalence of these eye conditions. And Australia is certainly not um, exempt. We um, estimates uh, put us around about 50% as well as having um, uh, my, uh, an incidence of 50% of myopia by the time we hit 2050. Whereas other countries such as um, East Asia, Southeast Asia and China, they're looking at prevalence rates closer to 60 to 65%. Our rates of myopia are not high, certainly not high by world standards. I'm not really surprised by that because we have a very lovely environment and we have a great, great emphasis on spending time outdoors and playing sport, all of which are, I think, helping to protect our children's eyes. However, among certain groups, so again, we did actually see in some particular pockets where you had children who were studying very intensively, we again saw very high rates of myopia amongst those children. So for instance, in academic selective schools, we saw rates of myopia between 50-60% uh, in children who are age 12. Now that's way above what we is found in the rest of the population. So again, it's where you have that coupling of the uh, intense education and little time spent outdoors you'll see that rise in myopia as well. I think my answer to that is very much in the evidence that comes from the epidemiological studies 
that have been running now since about the 1960s, which have shown a consistent rapid rise in the prevalence of myopia in certain populations. Now, rapid rises are in, uh, in a condition or a disease means that you're looking for environmental change. You're looking for things that have altered in the environment that have caused uh, this uh, disease to manifest itself. So over a matter of uh, decades, we've had the prevalence of myopia go from around about 30% um, up to well and truly over 80% in some of those populations. And that can only be environmentally driven. Yes, I do think it coincides with changes in behaviour, in particular around intensive schooling. So uh, for instance, um, in the 1960s, Singapore changed its schooling system to one that was competitive from quite a young age. And this has led to very intensive ed education at an early age of life. So we're really talking from preschool onwards. These children are in a competitive stream to achieve academically. And what this has meant is a change in lifestyle into doing more knee work and spending less time outdoors. We know that once children are myopic, they're already doing very low levels of time outdoors. So unless you intervene to change their time outdoors, you won't see an effect of, uh, of time outdoors on myopia progression. Light has been well known to release retinal dopamine in the retina. And retinal dopamine is a known eye growth inhibitor. So the way we think outdoor activity is protective, it's helping to regulate the way the eye grows by slowing down the rate of eye growth with the release of retinal dopamine. Myopia can be classified based on various factors such as age, cause, as well as the degree of the myopic refractive error. In terms of the degree of refractive error, it can be classified as mild, moderate or high. Mild refractive errors typically include myopia ranging from about minus one to minus three diopters. Moderate myopia includes refractive errors ranging from about minus three to minus six diopters. And high myopia is typically classified as being greater than about minus six diopters. So traditionally we thought of short-sightedness or myopia as being lower levels and higher levels. And we were concerned about eye diseases, things like macular degeneration and cataract and retinal detachments that could happen more so with higher levels of myopia. But what we understand now is that even with very low levels of myopia, there's an increased risk of these eye diseases which can occur across a person's lifetime. So even small amounts of myopia increase risk. And with each increasing amount of myopia, there is a higher risk of lifelong eye disease. As optometrists and primary eye care practitioners, I feel as though myopia is one of the burgeoning major issues that we deal with in everyday optometric practice. So I think that as eye care practitioners, we've been treating myopia from day dot. We should be we should understand that we're the leading experts in myopia control and in myopia management for our patients as one of the main conditions that we see in everyday practice. Establishing a myopia clinic is something you can do within your general full scope optometric practice. It means getting comfortable with paediatric vision care, getting comfortable with binocular vision assessment and management, and getting comfortable with paediatric contact lens fitting, because contact lenses are absolutely a part of paediatric myopia management. So you really just need to think about how you're going to structure your appointments, how you're going to structure your consultations and fees, and how you're going to fit this all into your practice. But it doesn't need to be anything out of the ordinary from your normal practice if you've made sure that you understand that you're comfortable with the knowledge base and with how you're going to put it into practice. I think that in everyday practice now, our normal practice clinics should be quite quickly evolving to be myopia control clinics. One of the things that we look at as far as a landmark study that really showed us the way is the landmark study from Brian Holden that was published in the Ophthalmology Journal that showed us that myopia is in fact a burgeoning epidemic that is occurring. It's not single isolated cases. So as primary eye care practitioners, we really should be understanding that our everyday ordinary practices should be evolving to really take on board myopia control as one of our key areas that we have to look after for our patients. In the last few years, the last few decades, we've had a huge explosion of research and best practice management guidelines in myopia that have 
enabled us to manage myopia far better than we used to be able to manage it. There's been lots of additions in things like ortho K management, in things like atropine management and daily disposable contact lens management for myopia control, coupled with lots of better advice about outdoor activity and sunshine that we should be integrating in everyday practice to guide our patients and get them better outcomes. What that means is that we're also guided by the things and findings from studies like Ian Flitcroft's findings to show that any increase in myopia in a patient exponentially increases their risk for myopia related pathology. We're talking about myopic macular degeneration, we're talking about increase of risk in retinal detachments and many other different myopia related diseases. So to me it seems essential that we stay up to date with best practice guidelines, we stay up to date with the latest research because there is a wealth of information that is continuing to evolve where we can improve our patients' lives. I started out my career and I actually was running a children's clinic and most of the patients at my clinic were children uh, and their parents who used to come in because the kids were not able to see the blackboard in the classes. And at the time, this was in the 90s, the only way we managed that uh, we managed myopia was to simply write out a prescription for spectacle lenses and asking them to come back uh, for a follow-up visit if, if their vision becomes blurred again. In the past uh, couple of decades, we've seen clear proof that myopia can be slowed with a number of interventions. So it depends a little bit on what country you're in and what the practitioner has access to what they can prescribe for your child. But there are a vast number of options and we shouldn't settle for just prescribing a straight pair of long distance glasses for a child with progressing myopia. That's simply not the standard of care anymore. We're fortunate to have a vast array of research available now to show us where we can use spectacle lens options for our progressing myopes and to show us that our contact lens options, whether that be ortho-K or soft multifocal lenses and low dose atropine are all quite similar in terms of their efficacy. So as the research is building, it's showing us more about who these treatments might work better for and how we can pick the right treatment for the right patient. But if you don't have access to all of the treatments available, if you can't prescribe atropine, for example, you can use these contact lens options. We've got a vast array of really useful tools. We do not understand the mechanisms underlying the faster eye growth, but we do know that there are certain risk factors associated with myopia. For example, parental myopia increases the risk of onset as well as progression of myopia. We also know that age has a certain role to play. For example, younger ages progress much faster in comparison to the older eyes. Even though we do not completely understand the mechanisms underlying the onset and progression of myopia, what we are able to show quite clearly in uh, many well-conducted randomized clinical trials that it is possible to slow the progression of myopia by a number of means. We can use optical strategies, um, spectacles, contact lenses, orthokeratology, or we can use pharmaceutical interventions such as low-dose atropine to slow the progression of myopia. For example, if you correct a myopic eye with standard spectacle lenses, we've seen that the image uh, at the peripheral retina falls behind the retina and this creates what we call hyperopic defocus. And it is hypothesized that this hyperopic defocus actually stimulates further progression of myopia. Therefore, at the Brian Holden Vision Institute, we have created uh, lens designs that try and bring this um, image forward, so reduce the hyperopic defocus so that the image, both at the central as well as the peripheral retina, is either on or in front of the retina. The objective is to have this image shell on the retina and therefore hopefully achieve lower progression of myopia. There are um, various spectacle lenses that do or ha can reduce myopia. The um, old executive bifocal, which has been around for an awfully long time, for those of you who uh, don't know, it's, the, it's a bifocal lens that has the whole bottom section de devoted to knee. That has been um, shown to reduce myopia. And here at the Brian Holden Vision Institute, we also developed a lens uh, called a myo lens, um, which is al was also effective in reducing myopia. 
The executive bifocal simply reduces the amount of effort needed at near, or well, that's the theory behind it. Um, although it, other lens types such as multifocal, uh, multifocal spectacles were not nearly as effective in reducing myopia compared to the executive bifocal. We don't really know the answer to why that is the case, but we do suspect that with something like a bifocal lens, it does force the child to be looking through the reading section because you set the bifocal part so high they can't avoid but look through the bottom section when they've got these glasses on. Whereas with the multifocal, because there's a corridor between the distance and the near, it's quite easy for children with active accommodation to not be looking through the near section and still see print clearly. The MyoDisc works on a more um, modern theory of peripheral um, hyperopic myopic defocus. So with this lens you have the, the, the part that you look through in the, um, in the distance um, as you would normally see for distance and then the periphery of the lens has um, plus added to it which has the effect of increasing the myopic defocus which is a known way of reducing um, myopia. Well certainly the evidence would suggest that atropine or a pharmaceutical treatment has the most, is the most effective way of um, controlling the rate of myopia progression. Um, the problem with atropine in the past is the um, side effects that you have with it. So atropine or a, con a high concentration of atropine will induce medriasis or dilate the pupil so we have photophobia and also we knock out the uh, uh, ciliary body so we have problems with accommodation. Now more recently we've been using low dose atropine which in reduces the effects of these particular um, or reduce of these side effects quite significantly. It doesn't reduce them completely, um, but there is still a little bit of conjecture as to the eff effectiveness of, of low dose atropine. Some of the evidence is, super, is extremely promising, but we're looking at more data to confirm that this does um, have the desired effect as far as myopic control is concerned. Now the problem with atropine is that you need to be therapeutically induced to use it. So it's not a, a universal um, method of uh, treatment by any means, but certainly um, in Australia as more optometrists become therapeutically qualified, it will be one of the more commonly used options. Once a child becomes myopic, it, it's not enough to just simply um, prescribe them atropine because they're myopic, they can't see things in the distance, so they need some type of correction to enable them to see clearly, otherwise they'll be disadvantaged when they're in the classroom. So we need to prescribe some type of optical device for this and ideally this should have myopic control properties. So generally most, most researchers would agree that spectacles aren't as effective in reducing or controlling myopia as what contact lenses are, which leaves us to the um, either using an orthokeratology option or with going with various soft contact lenses for myopia control. A recent review looked at um, the effectiveness across a number of studies and what they concluded was that the rate of myopic control uh, with ortho-K and with soft contact lenses is about the same. So from that perspective um, there shouldn't be any difference as to which option you go for. Now I know that orthokeratology practitioners will tell me that the um, that ortho-K is the most effective way to control contact lenses and maybe with a bit more research we will um, We'll, we will um, come to this conclusion. But at the moment, the research indicates that there's no difference um, in my controlling myopia with soft lenses or ortho-K. What we do know is that ortho-K does require a bit of a learning curve um, to actually uh, practice it successfully and safely. So if we look at the problem globally, um, I think that we need to come up with effective myopia control options in soft contact lenses because simply put, it's much easier to fit someone with soft contact lenses than what it is to fit someone with ortho-K lenses. So if we want to tackle this on a worldwide basis, we really need to uh, put a lot of effort into soft contact lenses as one of the first lines of defence. At the UNSW Myopia Clinic, when we see a myopic child, we do offer various treatment options. They include atropine eye drops, orthokeratology lenses, multifocal soft contact lenses, as well as multifocal spectacles. There is individual variability to responses to treatment, 
and we are unable to, at this point in time, predict which treatment will work best for an individual child. Therefore, at our clinic, we recommend a couple of treatments to the patient and explain the pros and cons of treatment as well as gaps in current research. And after discussion with the parent, the child, we are able to make a decision on the treatment that we believe will be the most effective. As a specialty contact lens practitioner, I find in practice the most effective myopia control management for my patients is orthokeratology. The reason being is that there is an improvement in their quality of life. There is also a real sense of ownership for the patient in terms of what they can proactively do to make sure that their myopia doesn't increase. And patients just seem to enjoy it as a mode of, of treatment. Um, I do know also that patients who still continue to increase, we're starting to integrate orthokeratology and atropine as combined treatments. But I think the main message for most of us as practitioners is that you're actually doing your best in terms of keeping up to date with the latest research and making sure it's a field that you watch with intensity because of the amount of research that we have to guide in best practice here. Studies that have looked at myopia control with orthokeratology typically involve two years of orthokeratology treatment. There have been some studies that have looked at the longer term effects of orthokeratology on myopia progression. It appears from these studies that there may still be some myopia control effects, however this is an area that still needs to be investigated. At the UNSW Myopia Clinic we have seen quite promising effects of orthokeratology on myopia control. Benefits of orthokeratology include improved self-perception and self-esteem in children as they don't need to wear spectacle lenses throughout the day. Furthermore, there are benefits in activities such as outdoor activities or sporting activities uh, without having to use any optical corrections. At our practices, we have a guide that we've developed for parents. And that guide goes through a lot of the um, information of options which are available for, for them to consider and this includes things like orthokeratology, multifocal contact lenses, atropine eye drops, um, bifocals or multifocals, and even vision therapy. So um, one of the questions that you had asked was, how are our practices set up and how do we help our parents? Like I mentioned earlier, the first option that we have is we really focus a lot on education. I think education is our primary key. We will spend time with our families and our parents to help them, um, to guide them through the, the options available to help them with their family and their kids. Um, the second one is that we are very well equipped with the technology that's required to deliver these services. For example, having a topographer to be able to measure the curvature of the cornea and be able to um, help, uh, you know, prescribe ortho K and contact lenses for their children. Um, we also have therapeutically endorsed optometrists so we can help prescribe 0.01 atropine and therapeutic drops. Um, our optometrists are also well educated when it comes to binocular vision and, in, and its impact it has on myopia. This emerging um, understanding on how binocular vision and eye strain does impact on myopia progression and in many cases I can actually see signs of um, children who are heading towards becoming myopic before they are even myopic. So we can speak to parents about, look, your child's heading into that direction. Why don't we look at their lifestyle and environmental uh, factors to see what we can do to mitigate, mitigate against those. Can we help them spend more time outdoors? Can we explain to parents how important it is to spend time outdoors and do more outside activities? Um, sometimes even having that conversation up front can make a big difference because they'll understand that no, maybe I shouldn't be taking the child straight into the house and spending the whole day doing indoors activities and, and screen time when I could be, uh, or I could be factoring in outdoor time for them. So it depends on the person. It depends on a child's capability with contact lenses. It depends on how quickly they're progressing on their prescription. There's a whole host of different products and tools that are available to the optometrist that they can discuss with the parent and the child to work out which is most suitable. So I started managing myopia actively in my practice around 10 years ago and I've been talking to colleagues in Australia and out around the world about this for many years. 
And until recently, we didn't have as much research available on soft multifocal lenses, and I'd always fit ortho-K. So ortho-K was generally my first choice uh, as a myopia control strategy. Now, we have understand more from uh, research around how these work, and we're getting more tools available to us. Industry is providing more tools for us. So we now have these soft lens options, which may be pretty much on a par with ortho-K. You can offer these to the patients and, and allow them to select between the two of them. But I've had really good success with ortho-K over the years. And quite a few years ago, I did an analysis of all of my pediatric patients who'd been wearing ortho-K for at least 18 months. And I found that only 20% of them actually progressed. Now these were a slightly older group, so as you fit younger children, you're likely to see more progression because they tend to progress more. But in this group of children, we had a, a significant number of them who didn't progress over sometimes up to five years of ortho-K wear. So it does work and it, also ortho-K as a modality is something that parents and, and patients really like to wear. It is important for optometrists to think differently about myopia. It is no more about treating a patient. There's a paradigm shift to managing a patient. We need to consider the fact that myopia control interventions will mean a greater interaction and a continuous interaction with the patient. We understand from the environmental influences that the practitioner needs to ensure that patients are aware of, of the impact of the time spent outdoors, etc. So practitioners need to engage in health promotion activity. However, we also know right now that many of the myopia control interventions and the approach to myopia control is relatively new. So there's an onus on practitioners to gain the education that properly equips them to be able to respond to this challenge. I think that myopia management is probably a much better term because it's an umbrella term. Myopia control is one aspect of myopia management because we, when we apply the treatment such as the contact lenses, the ortho -K, the spectacles or the eye drops to slow myopia, in that aspect we're trying to control the myopia. But at the same time we also need to look at the, the other risk factors that are there that are, that are myopogenic in a way kind of you know, increasing the stimulus to eye growth. So those other factors are such as, you know, how much time does the patient or the child or the individual spend outdoors? Is it sufficient? How much time is the individual spending on new work as well? All these factors need to be taken into account. And then also, you know, looking at in the family, is there a high risk of myopia? Are there a lot of people with myopia? Because all these factors will influence you in what you prescribe and how often you will see the patient. Everyone should get involved in myopia management. Teachers, policymakers, eye care practitioners, parents, patients, because it's only through this way that we can achieve change in slowing the progress of myopia and reducing the prevalence of myopia globally. Guidelines that are evidence-based that will allow practitioners to manage myopia in a systematic way so that treatments for specific ages, risk factors, uh, also details about when to review a patient and when to stop treatment will allow better patient outcomes. And this is critical for us to uh, prevent myopia-related blindness in the future. At the same time, ultimately the patient will benefit and governments and public health burdens will also be reduced. Unfortunately, it's all a little bit over for adults in lots of ways. This is a developmental uh, process. So when you're born, your eye is about 70% of its adult size. So it has to actually grow. The important thing is it has to grow in a regulated way. What happens with myopia is we seem to get an excessive rate of growth. And that is at its greatest while the child is actually growing. So once you become an adult, of course your growth rate has actually slowed. So just like your height, the rate of eye growth has also slowed. So you're really going to get maximum impact for protecting from myopia in early childhood rather than adulthood. Once you're myopic as an adult, there's probably little we can do at this time to change that. Unfortunately, myopia can't be reversed because what's happened is the eyeball's grown too long and we haven't worked out a magical way to shrink the eyeball back again. 
However, at very low levels of myopia, sometimes it can actually be something called pseudomyopia, which is sort of fake myopia. This is where the eyes might in fact be locking up from too much time spent looking up close and they can't relax back to see long distance. So if that is resolved, vision may improve. But generally once proper myopia has occurred and the eyeball's grown, that's it. We can't shrink the eyeball back again. We can just try to slow down that, that growth from there. Evidence has shown that if both your parents are myopic, you face a greater risk of developing myopia. So genetics does play a big role. However, we know that even if your parents are not myopic, due to environmental influences, you can also develop myopia. And if we look at the current projections in the world and the dramatic increase in the prevalence of myopia, most of that is due to the environmental impact. And that's good news in many ways. It means that if we do something about it, change our lifestyle, and show our children spend more time outdoors, etc., we can make a difference and slow this progression. So in the past, we understood myopia as primarily being a genetic condition. But over the past 10, 20 years, and especially over the past decade, it's been moving far too quickly and increasing incidence to just be genetic. We know that visual environment plays an enormous role in development of childhood myopia and what we also know is that educational pressures so the east asian educational pressure is something that is definitely associated with increasing rates of myopia compared to other schooling systems so while genetics might load the gun the visual environment is the thing that's an enormous risk for our children and it's something that we should be providing advice on to all of the kids we see and absolutely to children at risk children whose parents are myopic or children who have lower than age normal levels of hyperopia, which is the biggest risk factor for becoming myopic. We know that a child who has two myopic parents is much more likely to be myopic than a child who has no myopic parents. That's pretty well established. But one of the issues there is, do myopic parents create myopiogenic environments? So in other words, we tend to also translate our behavior to our children and the way they are grown up. So it's very hard in those sorts of studies to actually separate out whether it's actually uh, the parents and genes or whether it's in fact myopicogenic environments. Now, I would be a little bit cautious in taking that just as a, a straight statement because again, there is high, high myopia in families. So there is what we call familial high myopia. So if you have parents with high myopia, there's a chance that you might also have whatever that particular gene is to develop myopia. So you do see high myopia in families. Um, I think one of the things that kind of points to the interaction though that can potentially occur between genes and environment is some work in America um, looked at the effect of outdoor time on children who had two myopic parents versus no myopic parents and they did actually find if the children were doing more than 14 hours per week outdoors even if they had two myopic parents they were less likely at about age I think it was about 12 less likely to be myopic than the children with two myopic parents who weren't doing that level of outdoor activity so there was a protective effect even if the parents were myopic and actually delaying the onset of myopia is really the crucial thing because if a child becomes myopic in their early teens the chances of them developing high myopia are much less than the child who develops myopia at age six they've got a lot more growing to do the child at age 12 has six yes, less years in which they've got to do that growing and so they rarely develop high myopia unless of course they've got the familial high myopia that we talked about so I do think in this sense you can actually mitigate your risk somewhat by changing your approach to behaviour and lifestyle. We well know that genes do play a role in certain types of myopia. So uh, there are about uh, 250 syndromic conditions, which are genetic syndromic conditions, which have as one of the uh, effects myopia. One of the best known ones is probably uh, Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome uh, is a genetic abnormality in collagen formation. You have collagen in the sclera, the white part of your eye, and that's the part that actually grows excessively to develop myopia. So these people, unfortunately, uh, because of that genetic abnormality, are quite frequently myopic. 
So we know that there are a number of genetic pathways that can actually lead to myopia. There doesn't seem to be one single magic gene. And when we're talking about the recent rises in uh, childhood myopia, these ones that seem to be environmentally driven, there doesn't appear to be again any one particular gene or one group of genes that are solely responsible. There have been two large genetic uh, consortiums or studies if you like that have done uh, GWAS analysis and these are the CREAM consortium and the 23andMe uh, group who um, actually uh, were a genetic analysis group who collected information about when people first wore glasses. They ran a very similar analysis to the CREAM cons consortium and found many of the similar genes that the CREAM consortium found active in people with myopia. The particular thing is though, they found lots of genes and they found lots of genes of relatively small effect. So again, no magic bullet in terms of the gene that controls myopia. And if you've got an eye that's excessively growing, you're going to be having genes that are changing all the time that are related to that excessive growth. And that's pretty much what we see on those kinds of analyses. People have speculated about nutrition in various ways, but I don't think there's any kind of plausible, uh, again, pathway or you know, food type. There was some suggestion about um, uh, dietary changes, particularly diets higher in carbohydrates and, and sugars. Um, and there was a kind of a suggestion that that might be somehow related to the myopia ep epidemic. But again, it's not really borne out when you uh, look across the spectrum because you would expect then that um, you know, people who have uh, problems such as diabetes might be more myopic than the rest of the population. Not the case. So we, we really, diet has really um, not been looked at in a hugely systematic way, but really it, most of the work that's been done has fallen on pretty stony ground. So even though any level of myopia increased risks of long-term eye disease, higher levels of myopia, above five to six diopters, which means that someone can't see clearly past about 20 centimetres, that has higher risks. And it's because the eyeball has stretched so much that there are higher risks. So we might take a more aggressive treatment strategy. We might need to be really active, applying all of these treatments or combinations of treatments to try and slow down or stop that worsening and to try and stop the eye growing and stretching too much. Well, I think we are all, all practitioners are pretty much in agreement that uh, from about minus five and, uh, and lower, so, you know, minus six, minus seven, you're, with each increase in uh, myopia, you're increasing your risk of a number of conditions, um, including things like uh, retinal detachment and um, myopic maculopathy being the big ones. I wouldn't also overlook that the rate of uh, conditions like retinal detachment actually increase from about minus three onwards. So I don't think we can just look at the minus five and say everybody below that's fine and once you're above that you're not, not so fine. Um, you know, I think there's a real risk about retinal detachment. Uh, but retinal detachment is treatable if caught early enough and, and man managed early enough. Unfortunately, myopic maculopathy isn't. The other thing that of course impacts on the prevalence of myopic maculopathy is age. So the older you get, the greater the chances are that you will develop myopic maculopathy if you uh, are somebody over minus five diopters. Yeah. So it's that combination of the um, degree of myopia and age that really puts you into the risk category for uh, myopic maculopathy, which unfortunately is not yet treatable. So it unfortunately does cause visual impairment and blindness. The bulk of my uh, operations involves performing cataract surgery. A significant proportion of those on people who are very short-sighted uh, who've got myopia. People with myopia tend to get cataracts at an earlier age than people who aren't very short-sighted. Um, and the other part of my surgeries revolves around uh, sorry, retinal surgery. So. A variety of retinal conditions can be treated with surgery, and a lot of those are related to high myopia. So particularly conditions like retinal detachment, um, macular holes, uh, trauma, uh, complications of cataract surgery, 
and what's called an epirectal membrane or floaters and complication of diabetes. Those are some of the common retinal conditions I'd treat. In terms of retinal surgery, there's a few different types of surgery. Uh, the commonest procedure I'd perform would be something called a vitrectomy. And that's basically a type of keyhole surgery we do on the local anesthetic as a day case, where we pass some tiny keyhole instruments through the center of the eye and remove the vitreous gel, uh, which fills the eye. And that can be required for a variety of different reasons. The most common of those is, would be a retinal detachment. A retinal detachment is a condition in which the retina, which is the layer of nerves that lines the back of the eye, separates from the wall of the eye. Now, the basic reason this happens is because when people are short-sighted, the basic problem is that their eye is longer than average. And when your eyeball is longer than average, the internal surface area of the eye is larger. So the retina is stretched over a much larger area. So when the retina is stretched over a larger area, it's thinner and it's more fragile and prone to getting holes and tears. As we get older, the retina becomes thinner. And if you get a hole in the retina, what can happen is fluid from inside the eye can pass through the hole, get underneath your retina and lift it off the wall of the eye. And that's called a retinal detachment. And if that's not treated urgently, that can potentially lead to blindness. Quite often as a retinal surgeon, I would say to patients who come in urgently with symptoms of a retinal detachment, those symptoms typically being flashing lights or floaters or blurred vision or seeing a shadow or part of their vision missing. Um, a retinal detachment starts in the peripheral part of the retina and at that stage, patients may just even notice very few symptoms or very mild symptoms like slight blurring of vision, floaters or a slight shadow in the peripheral part of the vision. If it's not treated, the retinal detachment invariably progresses to the centre part of the retina which is called the macula. And once the macula is detached, uh, patients will lose vision permanently and so there's a significant degree of urgency in having to treat retinal detachments. There's two primary types of operation we do. The first is something called a scleral buckle, and the second is called a vitrectomy. A scleral buckle is a sort of older traditional form of surgery where a elastic band is stitched around the outside of the eye. The idea is the elastic band constricts the eye and it pushes the wall of the eye against the holes in the retina to close those holes. Uh, in more recent years, a much more commonly used method of treating a retinal detachment is called a vitrectomy. And so that's essentially a kind of keyhole surgery, which is under the local anesthetic as a day case procedure, where we pass some tiny keyhole instruments through the wall of the eye to remove the jelly, which is called the vitreous uh, in, in from the eye. We find the holes in the retina, we suck fluid out from under the holes to push the retina back into place, and we inject a gas bubble into the eye. And that gas bubble acts a bit like a splint and it holds the retina in place while it's healing, and then we apply some laser treatment to seal the retina in place. And that generally is quite effective as long as it's performed urgently. Uh, so pay, in terms of the results of retinal detachment surgery, if patients are treated before the center part of the retina or the macula is affected, they can usually make an almost complete recovery of vision. But if the macula is detached, uh, surgery will improve the vision, but it won't recover all of it. Another complication of myopia is early onset cataracts. So what that means is inside the eye there's a lens and when you're born that lens is crystal clear and it transmits all the light uh, from the front of the eye to focus it on the retina. Generally as you get older in your 70s, 80s and 90s the lens becomes cloudy and we call that a cataract and that uh, tends to make your vision blurrier. People who are very short-sighted, they tend to get cataracts at an earlier age, and they get a particular type of cataract, often called a posterior subcapsular cataract, in which the back part of the lens becomes cloudy. And that tends to affect people at much younger ages. It could occur in the 30s, 40s, or 50s, instead of the 80s and 90s. Typically, the symptoms patients get in that situation are uh, blurred vision and glare, particularly if they're driving at night. They, uh, headlights coming on may cause a lot of glare and halos, and it can become very difficult to drive at night. Um, some patients with uh, high myopia often just get an early onset age-related cataract, which is a typical type of cataract someone who's older would get, but it happens at a younger age. It's not entirely clear why people who are very short-sighted get cataracts at an earlier age, but fundamentally it may be related to the fact that their eyeball is larger um, there's more oxygen in the vitreous cavity, the space within the eye, and the oxygen has an, interacts with the lens proteins and causes in the, in the lens, and that causes loss of clarity. 
It's not entirely clear why people who are very short-sighted get cataracts in an earlier age, but fundamentally it may be related to the fact that their eyeball is larger, um, there's more oxygen in the vitreous cavity, the space within the eye, and the oxygen has an, interacts with the lens proteins and causes in the, in the lens, and that causes loss of clarity. Glaucoma is a very common condition in people who aren't myopic, and it's one of the commonest causes of blindness in Australia. Essentially what happens with glaucoma is the, the, at the back of the eye, fluid is produced, and that fluid circulates nutrients around the eye, and then the fluid escapes from little drainage channels at the front of the eye. In glaucoma, those drainage channels appear to become blocked, and the fluid doesn't escape as easily, and that can lead to depression in the eye building up, and that can damage the nerve at the back of the eye, leading to loss of peripheral vision. So that's one form of glaucoma, and that seems to be more common in people who are short-sighted. The mechanism as to why that is isn't fully understood at the moment, but it's a definite finding which we see in clinical practice on a daily basis. High myopia is associated with, as I've said, a number of uh, complications. Some of those are curable and treatable of surgery, but some aren't. So uh, one of the treatable ones would be a retinal detachment. And as I said before, you can get very good results if retinal detachments are treated early. One of the most serious and blinding complications of high myopia is uh, myopic macular degeneration. And unfortunately, at present, there's no treatment for that. Essentially, what happens in macular degeneration, uh, the, the eye, the, the retina is a layer of nerves that lines the back of the eye, and the light lands on the center part of the retina, which is called the macula. So it's the macula that's important for your, for your very fine uh, vision and, and, and high quality vision. In people who are very short-sighted, the retina in general is thinner, and the macula in particular is thinner. And as you get older, as the guy eye elongates and the retina becomes thinner, the macula gets thinner. And so, it's set, simplistically, the cells tend to wear out, and you get an early onset uh, age-related degeneration of the macula. Uh, so, typically, that would manifest as gradual onset of blurred vision or distorted vision. Sometimes that can lead to a sudden loss of vision if they get bleeding in the macula. So this gradual wear and tear of the macula is not treatable uh, currently, so that's why it's very, very important uh, to try and prevent myopia progression as much as possible. So we started the Myopia Control Clinic here at the UNSW Optometry Clinic in about March 2015. We saw it as a wonderful opportunity to uh, serve the community and those um, kids with myopia. Uh, it was developed uh, in conjunction with Pauline Kang, who has fabulous expertise in myopia control. And we have some great resources here in, um, in our staff and in our um, instruments. We began it also as a, as a way of teaching future optometrists um, how to manage children with myopia. There are so many resources available for being able to put myopia research into clinical practice. The Brian Holden Vision Institute has developed a myopia calculator where you can input a child's age and their current refraction and it will predict where they'll end up from an evidence base at age 17. And this is a useful tool to be able to talk about myopia management strategies with parents. I also run a Facebook group that's got over 3,000 members from 30 countries called Myopia Profile, where we all love talking about myopia all day long and talk about clinical cases, industry innovations and the latest research. And there's lots of websites available too, where you can find the latest research and understand things from the scientific perspective as well as a clinical perspective. The whole area of myopia has been a subject of research for you know, more than 30 years. And in recent times, there's been absolute jumps and leaps in this area where clinical strategies of treating and slowing myopia performed in animals were then trialled in children and have been shown to be able to slow myopia effectively. So because there is so much research out there, a lot of this hasn't been formalised in a way of standardising the way we should be applying these treatment strategies to uh, children and adults that are progressing in myopia. So the Brian Holden Vision Institute has been working in the area of myopia for more than two decades and also has been instrumental in, um, you know, uh, trialling these treatments in animals in collaboration with the University of Houston and then engaging manufacturers to produce the prototype contact lenses and spectacles which we've then uh, trialled with, you know, ethical approval in countries such as China as well as in Australia to see how well these have worked. 
And based on our depth of knowledge in this area, our experience and our engagement with the health department and the WHO, BHVI has decided that it is time to work together with everyone to produce guidelines to guide practitioners on how to navigate this area, how to treat children in a way that's standardised so that we can you know, achieve better results by everyone following the same types of principles and guidelines to treat myopia. In this respect, uh, research has shown that uh, outdoor intervention has um, outdoor intervention can slow the onset of myopia. And at the Brian Holland Vision Institute, we have uh, partnered with the Shanghai Eye Disease Prevention and Treatment Center. And the Shanghai Eye Disease Prevention and Treatment Center group are uh, in the process of conducting a large scale clinical trial of uh, outdoor intervention of two doses, 40 minutes and 80 minutes. This is currently being conducted in Shanghai, China and approximately 7,000 children are randomized to either a control group or one group getting an extra 40 minutes outdoors and a second group getting an extra 80 minutes outdoors. It is hoped that the results of this trial will help educators as to whether improving outdoor time can slow the onset of myopia. We have adopted a multifaceted approach to addressing the issue of myopia. From a translational research perspective, we are developing various products that will slow the progression of myopia. From a public health perspective, we have engaged in various service delivery projects that have uh, resulted in people getting access to services in underprivileged communities. We more recently launched a campaign called Our Children's Vision that is aiming to reach 50 million children across the world, both in the developed and developing world. From an education perspective, we are providing education for optometrists across the world to ensure that they are properly equipped to respond to this challenge of myopia. So no doubt, as you've heard over the past week, we know that the number of people set to be affected by myopia worldwide is set to increase significantly. Uh, that means that there's going to be this unprecedented demand on eye care and ophthalmology services worldwide. Now in Australia, optometrists do outnumber ophthalmologists five to one. The Centre for Eye Health, where I work, basically we're there to fill in that gap, particularly for the patients who are perhaps asymptomatic or with more stable chronic presentations who might not otherwise get the care that they need in a timely manner. Uh, so the Centre for Eye Health is a referral-only intermediate tier care type establishment. In other words, in an optometry ophthalmology collaborative care clinic that's funded by Guide Dogs New South Wales ACT. Uh, we provide access to over 20 state-of-the-art ocular imaging devices uh, particularly to patients in need and, and there's no charge to either the patient or the referrer. Optometrists can refer through either one of two ways. Option one is for an imaging and visual function service assessment. Uh, so that's where you might select, for instance, between three and five tests and we'll, we'll complete those. So that includes things like OCT, for instance, Optimap imaging or stereoscopic retinal photography. Option two, which is for a full condition ocular assessment, we do uh, provide a high myopia suite type of testing. Which, is, which includes your kind of imaging assisted full dilated peripheral retinal examination and a more detailed look at the posterior pole as well. And that has very specific focus for myopia related complications. Um, in addition to seeing your patients directly, we also want to support you as optometrists in the profession. And so in, in line with that, we do regularly produce evidence-based chairside references, which are available on our website free of charge and they're there to help you hopefully with the interpretation of imaging. We also in affiliation with Optometry Australia um, have a, an online learning, learning platform known as uh, Learning for Vision. We've been running studies into myopia both here and abroad for a number of years. Um, a couple of, some years ago we um, commenced a trial, a large clinical trial in um, one of our centres in China and one of the lenses that we added was our um, extended depth of focus or EDOF lens which we initially thought was a, a good lens for correcting presbyopes or, or um, helping people with reading whilst wearing contact lenses. And some of our theoretical modelling suggested that this might be a useful lens for myopia control as well. So we added that to the trial and what we found is that the EDOF lens does um, significantly reduce myopia and we did this on a large number of children, about 100 children wore this lens um, over a two-year period and we were getting um, reductions of up to 40 percent. 
if you haven't been involved in Mopia management as yet, there are a lot of resources available for you to upskill. So there are evidence-based uh, you know, resources that you can use. So the Brian Holden Vision Institute uh, has put together the first global online course to teach the theories of myopia management. So the theories about the risk factors for myopia development, um, the theories about how the optical uh, treatments slow down myopia progression. And it also provides interactive case studies and a webinar to allow you know, practitioners to interact with experts in this area and gain further knowledge. So that's a great starter. And all the information in that course is all based on the literature, so it's all evidence-based. And then there's the Brian Holden Vision Institute calculator, which has aggregated all the information from all the previous journal articles about the rates of progression in children for the different treatments. And this kind of calculator is fantastic because you can use it to demonstrate to your patients uh, what their expected or predicted level of myopia will be if uh, they just continue wearing you know, single vision spectacles. And then you can input the patient's age and then the treatment option and predict the level of myopia by the age of 17 with treatment. So you can use these tools to demonstrate to your patients. So enrolling in an in a online course is, is a great way to you know, get a basic understanding. Um, using an online tool to bring into your practice to demonstrate the effect of myopia uh, management. There's also a lot of uh, free online resources that you can look up which are created by uh, other practitioners. Um, these online resources do contain uh, communication flyers that you can use to help uh, with explanation to your patients and their parents about what myopia is, the risk of myopia increasing, and also explain the different treatment options. There's also the International Myopia Institute. So this is the think tank, the group of uh, international experts that have been brought together to develop white papers um, that will be published guiding people on how to manage myopia. These will be available later on in the year. There's free membership to this group and this just allows you to keep in touch to hear about the latest research uh, from you know, a peer-reviewed evidence-based uh, background. And furthermore, do not forget the wealth of knowledge within your profession. A lot of your peers may already be doing a myopia management in their practice. So speaking to them through either, you know, face to face, there are a few online forums such as a Facebook group on myopia. Um, creating your own LinkedIn group can also be helpful to bounce different ideas, how to manage cases, um, share clinical tips such as how to, uh, you know, improve the vision in an ortho K or fit ortho K better, improve vision in contact lenses, what type of spectacles or, um, you know, executive bifocals they're prescribing, how to fit them. All these uh, details you can find out just by speaking to your friends who are in the profession already doing myopia management, attending the conferences. So you don't have to work alone or be isolated because myopia management is also an area that allows you to interact with a lot of other interested practitioners, both in your country or around the world. Hi, I'm Maria Markui and I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. I'm also an optometrist and I did both my undergraduate and my postgraduate degrees here at this university. I wanted to tell you a bit about my story in terms of uh, my myopia development. My mum is myopic and as a child I spent a lot of time reading up close. I was a, a bit of a nerd, did a lot of, uh, borrowed a lot of books from the library and very rarely spent any time outdoors. So it comes as no surprise that when I was in my early teens I started to have trouble seeing things on the board at school. So I'd be sitting right, right at the front and I'd still have trouble, I'd be needing to squint in order to see things. So my mum took me to an optometrist and the optometrist told me the bad news that I was developing my OPI and that I needed to wear my glasses essentially full time. Being a very self-conscious teenager, I didn't do that. Uh, I wanted to fit in, I didn't want to stand out with glasses and so I carried on as I was. And I remember this one time when I was walking to the train station with my friends, a boy that I had a bit of a crush on in the distance was waving at me. And I saw someone, someone waving at me, but I wasn't quite sure who it was, so I didn't wave back. And the next time I saw him, 
he said to me that I was a bit of a snob because I ignored him. That absolutely crushed me and I decided from then on that I had to wear my glasses every time I was um, awake essentially so I could see what was going on. Now I remember putting them on and realizing that I could see, I could see individual little droplets of water on, le on the leaves of a tree and all this detail that I was missing without wearing my glasses. And as, as I started to get into my mid to late teens, I became really self-conscious. I was a very gorgeous looking teenager. I had pimples, I um, had the glasses going on, I had the frizzy hair. I, it was, I was a fantastic piece of work. And by my late teens, I started thinking that, right, I had to do something about this. So I went and visited my local optometrist, optometrist George Milios in Cogra, who uh, prescribed, prescribed me my first pair of soft contact lenses and that absolutely changed my life. Uh, I don't think that's much of an exaggeration. It really changed how I felt about myself. And at that point, I decided that optometry was what I wanted to do because I could make a difference to people's lives just by helping them see and also feel good about themselves. So in my early 20s, I continued to progress and then I just, when I decided to do a PhD, I continued to progress yet again. And while I was progressing, I wasn't really um, getting an eye test, ironically, given my profession. So I wasn't getting a dilated fundus exam to make sure that my retina was healthy. And as we know, uh, with progressive myopia, you have an increased risk of retinal holes and retinal detachments, which could, which could lead to blindness. Uh, so in, in about 2015, I was on a flight uh, coming back to Sydney from Brisbane and I remember feeling like I'd seen something whiz by the plane and I thought that's not right and had another look outside and realised that it, what I saw wasn't whizzing past the plane but was actually in my own eye. I was getting a lot of floaters. So as soon as I got back, I visited my optometrist here, Agnes Choi at the Centre for Eye Health and Agnes did a dilated fundus exam and sure enough, there was, I had a retinal hole, actually two retinal holes in my left eye and a, one retinal hole up the top here in my right eye. If we hadn't had that tested out quite quickly, uh, I could have ended up with a retinal detachment uh, because there was quite a bit of area where the retina had lifted off. So Agnes sent me off for, um, to an ophthalmologist very quickly and I had um, the, the retina lasered and, and luckily I was um, in the position where I didn't lose any vision. So that's my story with myopia. Everyone has their own story and I think it's one of those things where we need to come up with ways to prevent the development of myopia and pre prevent its progression. As clinicians, we are now starting to um, have these uh, means available to us. And with more research coming along in this area, there'll be more out there that we can do.